uh, I want to talk about where we are at present and then what can be done and how uh, leveling up might be done. I'm calling it regional regeneration, which I think uh, captures it rather better because leveling up might suggest that we're sort of, you know, leveling back to some sort of status quo. And it's precisely the status quo that is broken. And therefore, we need a different model and different approaches. So very briefly, where we are and then what should be done and how. I want to start with three stylized facts, if I may. Uh, and the first one is that labour productivity per head in London is now nearly 70% higher than virtually anywhere else uh, in the United Kingdom. And the second stylized fact is that more than half of all foreign direct investment and two thirds of venture capital investment for businesses big and small is going to businesses in the South East and of course, especially London. Um, and that is another indication uh, of the sheer disparities. And then the third stylized fact is, uh, and Will uh, hint at that in his introduction, the UK has one of the most centralized political and financial systems among all 38 industrialized countries of the OECD. So that I think already paints a picture. But well, what is essentially the framework that enables us to understand what's happening? Well, this isn't a simple story of North versus South or city versus province, rather, it is a question of widening disparities economically as well as socially, and they're happening at, in different ways. So one is a pattern of differentials in productivity, growth, wages, um, and other economic indicators that is both a pattern within regions, but also between regions. So it's not the case that the whole of the Southeast is wealthy, um, uh, or the whole of London for that matter. There are also huge disparities within these regions, but then also with, you know, between regions in the UK. The second point is about growing income and asset inequalities. So they are widening rather than reducing. And linked to that, many pockets of social deprivation. So where you know, jobs, wages, uh, life chances, opportunities are so low, that it's going to take a you know, Herculean effort to get these places anywhere near uh, a situation where people have something to live on and to flourish. Let me start with some charts just to illustrate some of these points. So here you can see uh, our forecast at the National Institute for Economic Growth. We published this earlier today. This is the autumn forecast. Strong growth this year, of course, with 7%. This is still the COVID rebound. Still strong growth next year with nearly 5%, but then it tails off very quickly. So even a lifetime of this parliament, we're going to be back to around one and a quarter percent as an average growth rate between 2023 and 2025 and six. And that means, you know, we are not in an era of high growth yet. A lot more would have to happen for that to be the case. And then the real wage squeeze, which is really important for uh, uh, living standards and in that sense for raising, uh, you know, the, um, the level across the United Kingdom. You can see here, that we are not predicting and not forecasting uh, very strong real earnings growth. And this is on top of a decade of real wage stagnation since the financial crisis. Now, that is still in aggregate terms, so I'm very keen to move on to the distributional aspect, and we'll mention this at the beginning. Look at regional labour productivity in the United Kingdom, how far London is ahead of everywhere else, including parts of the South and the East, the Midlands, the North and, and also the devolved nations of well, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. And that, of course, is driving uh, living standards and prosperity in very significant ways. And then, until we see you know, a huge catching up, uh, we are only going to see disparities uh, widen rather than, rather than reduce. Uh, something similar uh, is true when you look at it in terms of where we're going with this. So in 2019, pre-COVID, we already had London way ahead. It slightly changed at that point in 2020. But again, on current trends, we are back to a situation that's quite close to 2019. London way ahead, you know, by about 70% compared with many other places. Now, this is not just true for productivity. It is also true for income per head, which you can see here, London and the wider southeastern area around it. And it's true for assets as well. There's a huge concentration in the south of the country, in particular, the southeast uh, around London. And then, and this is the final uh, chart for now, or cartogram, I should say, uh, extreme poverty. So it's not only the case that we're seeing labor productivity, growth, and wages differ very widely. It's also that we've got areas of the country where 
destitution, which is extreme poverty, could double uh, over the next year or two, especially in the Northwest. But that is in the absence of any further uh, targeted policy intervention. It's a very worrying prospect because not only are these areas further falling behind, but the scarring, both economic and social, will be such it will take another generation or two. So, you know, things are getting worse, uh, not better for people in those parts of the country. But it's not only the uh, economy uh, where we have to uh, point out the disparities. They're compounded by differences in proximity to political and financial decisions. And government and finance are over-centralized in the United Kingdom, concentrated as they are in London and the Southeast. And it's this combination of centralized governance coupled with widening economic and social divergence that makes regional regeneration such an important priority. But the UK's system of government and governance is simply not fit for purpose. It is over-centralized and at the same time weak in terms of delivery. We don't have the institutions that connect the national to the region and to the local level so that things really get done. We have a fragmented system where it's not clear who's really responsible for what. Uh, and we have an endless policy chart. In the area of higher and further education, to which I'll come back, there have been 35 different policies over the last 20 years. And that simply isn't a way of addressing deep-seated problems. Local government for long term has been emaciated and emasculated with very, very few uh, powers and levers to change things. And even the new regional levels, the city regions and the mayoralties still lack substantial powers and resource in order to address the problems. And they may also not yet be sufficiently accountable to their own citizens and communities. Uh, they're largely essentially accountable to central government. Now, that may be not entirely true for the devolved administrations in Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland, and, and to a less extent London, but I would suggest we are a long way from really functioning regional and local government in this country. And the current system, uh, you know, isn't going to be uh, much improved uh, through extra funding alone. Yes, that will help. It's a precondition, but we also need local delivery uh, and we need institutions that can sustain with higher public spending and greater private investment over the longer term. So let me then turn in, my, in the second part of my presentation to what should be done and how. So I think some of the principles we need for regional regeneration are, first of all, a medium to long-term strategy. Again, we'll mention at the beginning, it can't just be a few years. It has to really be a 10-year project, and in some respects, a generational one. It has to be at scale. We need the right sort of investment at scale. For instance, skills, you know, three billion in the budget and the spending review is not nearly enough. It's not a revolution, it's a drop in the ocean. And we need to recognize all the interdependencies. So yes, it's great to focus on infrastructure in some ways, obviously great to improve rails uh, and, and, and bus services, but we need to connect the physical infrastructure to the digital and to the social infrastructure. You cannot treat these as somehow isolated or separate. So that means a joined up approach, much better policy coordination at the same levels and between levels, and also something in line with subsidiarity, that is locating power and resource at the appropriate level. That can be the national level, of course, and national government will be critical, but it also needs to be local and regional government for many other uh, areas. So in practice terms, what does that mean? A new institutional ecology really, where the financial system needs to be decentralized and spread across the country. Skills need to be built up in critical areas, both sectors, but also regions of the country. We need innovation to benefit not just the frontier firms that are doing wonderfully well, and that's a great asset to the country, but also the long tail that isn't currently benefiting from dissemination uh, of R&D, which again is very impressive in the UK, but it's just too concentrated in certain sectors and areas uh, of the country. We need an infrastructure uh, uh, that is a lot better than what we currently have in physical, digital, and social terms, and a different government and governance system. I want to pick out three areas, and there will be uh, the focus uh, in the remaining uh, few minutes. First of all, faced with over-centralized capital markets, what do we do? Uh, where the money simply isn't flowing enough from London and Southeast into the uh, you know, other uh, parts of the, the country. We need regional and central banks strongly encouraged to lend within areas and sectors. Other countries have this. The US has a more decentralized financial system. Germany does. Britain does not, and that's a huge uh, problem, uh, as we will see in a minute when we see the concentration of firms. And I think 
combined with that is also expanding the remit of the National Infrastructure Bank. It's a great initiative. We at the National Institute welcome it. We've called for it for, for a long time. Excellent that it's located in Leeds. However, it should be broadened to be a whole national investment bank because we need to support a lot more than simply infrastructure, however important that may be. And why do we need a different financial system with both regional and sectoral banks as well as a national investment bank? Well, here you can see uh, where firm births are happening. And it's essentially, again, mostly in London and a lot less elsewhere. And you can see on the right hand side, the connections. Again, London is absolutely at the center of everything. And that simply is not good for an economy that is very open, hence very vulnerable to shocks, and therefore needs to build up a lot more resilience across the board and not only have a powering center. So this economy is lopsided and uh, we've seen the results uh, over the last 12 years since the financial crisis, the Brexit vote, and then COVID. The second area I want to briefly mention is skills. We've got a massive skills mismatch where we have uh, not the right uh, mix uh, and lots of areas are lacking in uh, uh, skilled uh, labor. So the response has to be building partnerships between existing higher education and further education institutions in order to foster uh, all the hybrid skills. So the skills that aren't purely academic or purely vocational or technical, but somewhere in between. So engineering, law, finance, uh, banking, and many subjects are not just one or the other, they're both, and that's where you need the partnerships. Uh, it's essentially the missing middle in the auger review. Uh, and so far, of course, we need to uh, wait for, uh, we have waited for the government to respond to AUGA, and that will be a critical part of its response. Can it address the missing middle between pure HE and pure FE? But we also need to bring together businesses, trade unions, and local government in order to provide significantly more apprenticeships. It's a vital uh, entry into the labor market. And uh, whilst the apprenticeship levy is very good, uh, the scale of it is still far, far too small. And then we need to create more vocational entry opportunities into the labor market, especially in the areas where we have acute skill shortages like health and social care, but also other parts that would support the economy. So in concrete terms, what that means is we need to really look at higher and further education uh, in areas like Teesside, uh, but also in places like Wolverhampton or Stoke or Huddersfield or Preston, where they all exist, but they are uh, significantly underfunded, have had cuts for 10 years. And what's in the spending review and the budget is not enough to get this to a proper level. Or think of the mixed colleges in places like, well, in towns and cities that have fallen behind, like Preston, Blackpool, Southend or Grimsby. They, again, deserve a lot more support than they're currently getting. Let me just show you very briefly a correlation between uh, national vocational qualification levels and, uh, and productivity. And again, you can see how the areas where you've got high qualifications also correlate with the areas where workers are very productive. And you've got this cluster of low productivity, um, low qualification, uh, and that simply is holding many parts of the country back. Let me uh, turn to the third and final area, and that is how we change policy, design, and delivery. And for that, we need to empower both local and regional government. Boosting its capacity, yeah. Boosting its capacity uh, by providing revenue streams that aren't directly controlled by the Treasury. The business uh, rate retention scheme may be a step in the right direction, but again, we are, we, we are saying that is not enough to really empower local government. Uh, we also need to strengthen its ability to adapt to local requirements so that needs and potentials are recognized, linking uh, infrastructure to education, housing, and training. So it's all joined up and not in silos. Uh, and finally, enhance accountability to citizens and communities, not just to, not just to central government. So my conclusion uh, for now is regional disparities are widening uh, at the same time as the poorest households were sliding into destitution. But in terms of our national history after the war, as well as international comparison today, there are lots of examples of how regional regeneration can be done. But what it does require is a long-term strategy at the appropriate level and scale, and with lots and lots of local and regional uh, capacity to design and deliver both public spending and private investment. Otherwise, this is a top-down diktat from central government. It will not succeed. Thank you very much. 